the number one digital content creation package in the world. 3ds Max is unambiguously the most important 3D modeling and animation package in the world. Almost every single important game, every single important movie is somehow touched by 3ds Max. There's over 300,000 users, known users around the world. This is a package that is used by literally every important game developer and every important movie studio. It's also increasingly used by companies that are using it for architectural simulations or architectural renderings. These projects are becoming so grand and so expensive in order to compete for those very limited jobs, architectural firms have to put their best foot forward. They have to help their clients visualize what the project is really going to look like. A sketch is no longer good enough. You have to help them visualize it and feel it in a photorealistic way. Now we've been working with Autodesk and especially the 3ds Max team for quite a long time. We worked in areas related to Quadro for interactive previewing. We've worked in the area of Mental Ray, the first ray tracer that has been uh, incorporated into 3ds Max. Um, today, we're going to announce a giant step forward in our collaboration and introduce to the world a capability that is just never seen before. To help me introduce that idea and make that announcement, I'd like to welcome Ken Pimentel, Mr. Marketing for 3ds Max, and Michael Kaplan. Good to see you again. Michael, welcome. Good morning. Hi. Michael is uh, one of the one of the uh, the brains behind what we're about to see. Definitely. Well, before we get going, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about 3ds Max and and um, let's see, we're going to pop it on the screen, right? Yeah, we can uh, show the monitor Maybe here. Maybe they could You'll just see 3ds Max. This is what 3ds Max looks like. And and Ken, help help us understand what do people do with 3ds Max. Well, they do a lot of different things, and in this case, we're showing you the viewport for 3ds Max. This is where uh, an artist would uh, create their reality, uh, move things around, uh, and set up uh, the vision that they want to show to their uh, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So what we, we're going to show you here is a uh, typical scene that an architect might be working with. This is an indoor scene, and what they want to do is have a, a photo reel uh, experience for their uh, important stakeholder that's coming to, to meet them. So they've hit the rendering button and about... And so, so the first thing you do is you simulate, you, you, you capture the, 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 the 3D scene, the geometry of the scene, and of course you, you have to place onto it textures and, and you got to program... You got to dress it up, mm -hmm, dress it up. Uh, you know, it comes from tools like Revit and AutoCAD or an inventor bringing all this data in. Uh -huh. And then in 3ds Max, you aggregate it and dress it up and create something more real, you know, uh -huh. and bring the, the person into the design through photorealism. And at some point, you're happy with your design. Yes. Um, and, but you're, you're still not sure. You just want to preview it and right. um, to see what it's really going to look like. And so you have to do a photorealistic render. Exactly. And so back in the good old days, we would either, either look at it like this in a wireframe mode. And then, of course, in uh, some of our earlier collaborations, we could actually render this uh, with textures and, and right. shading. And, uh, but it's not photorealistic. No. It's about as photorealistic as a game. Right. And so we know it's not photorealistic. And, then, and at some point, Mental Ray was incorporated into, into 3ds Max so that you could do that photorealistic rendering right. using, using uh, ray tracing. Right. And so, so uh, I think, Michael, you're going to show us now what you just popped up earlier. Right. That's Mental Ray doing ray tracing. And I started this process uh, at the beginning of the keynote about an hour ago. Uh huh. So simulating reality is a very computationally intense problem. And customers, uh, the only solution to it has been in the past that we have to cheat. We have to figure out ways of simplifying the process, doing interpolations to maximize what a CPU uh, can do for and us. So, so, I want, so for, uh, speaking of, speaking of uh, CPUs, at the moment, you're currently rendering on on, um, on what? This Two, is a workstation right yeah, here. This, this would be a typical workstation that our users would have. It has two dual quad-core um, processors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a lot of horsepower, and it's required even to get, you know, to simulate reality. And in fact, rendering is one of the most computationally demanding parts 
uh, of content creation today. Indeed. Right? Yes, indeed. And so this is this is a mental ray. This is a product that that was a uh, was a uh, uh, revolutionized by mental images. Michael, this is how many years ago that mental oh, ray came 20, out? 20 20 years. 20 ago. years ago, yeah. right? Yeah. And it was uh, it was one of the world's first ray tracing first photorealistic mm -hmm. ray traced render. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And so so uh, y you said it earlier, but I wonder if everybody picked it up. You launched mental ray to render that scene. To render one frame. An hour at ago. the beginning of our right. at the beginning of and our keynote, you can okay. see it's working on 16 cores, 100 percent of the time, and it just filled in another piece of information. Uh -huh. But uh, mental ray, even in this case, is using interpolation and other other uh, approaches to to sort of fake reality. It's not doing a real physical. Well, simulation. if you had to fake reality, everybody would want to fake it differently, right? So uh -huh. you, you guys probably give give uh, the user a lot of control, right? Is that what you guys would do? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. So another big problem when you want to uh, simulate reality has been that these rendering systems, because they use interpolation and different techniques to s accelerate things, they have a command panel that, that looks like you're flying a 747. I mean, it, there's so many dials and settings and parameters uh -huh. that you can use to adjust uh, the, the faking of the reality. And so I'm an I'm a, I'm a architect. Mm -hmm. I just want a photorealistic render exactly. of this room. I right. don't want to be an expert in computer graphics. Exactly. Yes. Right? And so, so uh, in order to use Mental Ray, you have to be familiar with computer graphics enough to be able to enter this panel with yes. all these parameters. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And it's very, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a science that they don't really want to learn. So what's unique about uh, including iRay in 3ds Max is the setup. So if we can switch our rendering, so we're going to switch from Mental Ray, and we're going to switch over to uh, iRay. And so, so this is something uh, that, that some of the audience, oh, wrong. Yeah. Yep, this is something that some of the audience have, have heard about. It's a, it's a technology called iRay. It mm -hmm. is the world's first physically correct photorealistic Photo renderer. Right. And it's completely GPU accelerated. And, uh, and you guys are announcing today yes. that iRay will be part of the 3ds Max package. For subscription users, next week they'll start, be able to start downloading iRay and PhysX mm -hmm. um, to have, be able to actually do these things we're going to show you right now. Okay. Now, I think one important thing to stress is you've been talking about simulation for science yeah. and all these things. Here, we are physically simulating every photon as it passes through the scene. We're not interpolating. We're actually doing the real hard part of the problem, physically simulating reality. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is for the audience that, that isn't as familiar with computer graphics. This is an area that we wanted to innovate for some time, which is to move from, from uh, computer graphics, traditional computer graphics of rasterization and others, and other techniques to fake, if you mm -hmm. will, as Ken was describing, the imagery on the screen. We want to move towards computational visualization, computational graphics. And so using computer techniques, just as you use for computational fluid dynamics or uh, computational molecular dynamics, we want to move towards a computational techniques as well um, ourselves. Now, Michael, you're one of the brainchilds behind iRay. Tell us about, you know, what is the, you, you worked on Mental Ray before, you worked on iRay. What is the breakthrough about iRay? What's well, the, the big deal the big about it? the big breakthrough is, as Ken said, that we're able to actually simulate light physically by tracing every photon in the scene. And in order to be able to do that, you have to, ma you have to model the interaction of the light coming from a variety of light sources through materials like glass, bouncing off of things, um, being refracted by the glass, being absorbed by materials, being transmitted and blurred out by materials, semi-glossy materials. And to do this requires an enormous amount of floating point computation. And then to make it really work properly, you have to simulate billions and billions of samples you have to sample all sorts of multi-dimensional space to make this work. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so to do the sampling in the past was just not really practical on a CPU unless you had a supercomputer because you just did not have enough floating point computation on the desktop to be a useful process to do this kind of visualization. And so mm -hmm. in the past it was always done through interpolation techniques where they sort of work but you have to know exactly how to set them up and no matter how well you do at the end of it, you may not get the result that you want. I see. And it's because they sort of work, 
everybody's seen and everybody's because everybody's subject is a little bit different. Yeah. Their, their scenario is a little bit different. Every scene is different. You might find that what used to work for one scene no yeah. longer works for this scene, and you got to tweak right. it a little bit more. All and that's of why those you have to settings you saw before were mm -hmm. set per scene mm -hmm. and even maybe per view. And so in the case of iRay then, yeah. all of the material inside the environment would use real this world. technology called BRDF. Correct. Right, bidirectional reflectance. Mm -hmm. Real world materials, real uh -huh. world lights, um, and mm -hmm. real world design. Mm -hmm. Much like ANSYS does on the, on the physics mm -hmm. side. Simulate, trying mm -hmm. to simulate the world. Well, let's see it. Uh, let me show you quickly all, the, um, all of the uh, controls you need to control iRay. Okay. There they are. Yeah, what's great about iRay <laughs> is it introduces a whole new level of uh -huh. usability. It's point and shoot. So you can see here. So it's almost like a camera, but easier. It's exactly. A, it's, it's, it's one virtual setting. Virtual it's really how long do you want it to process. Uh -huh. That's the only setting that drives iRay. Mm -hmm. And so now I can tell it to render the same scene that you saw an hour of pre-processing. Um, hadn't even finished half of the pre-processing. OK, so right now, the GP, as I see GPUs on the lower right, the GPUs aren't nothing. doing anything yet. Right. And why is that? The CPU is still working on pre-processing. It's translating the data into the form GPU needs and moving it over to the GPU. And then in just a second, there, there go. we go. The GPUs are now, now fully computing. loaded, uh, wow. processing the scene. And now, Mike, Michael, one of the things that, that is a real benefit of iRay, um, you, if you could talk about point to the subtle, subtle visual effects right. that we're seeing, that as a result of a physically real mm -hmm. photon simulator, what are the benefits that you get? Well, first of all, um, you're seeing all the light in the room come in through double double set of windows, then being reflected off of a semi-glossy floor, going through this uh, semi-reflective uh, table. There's an interior lights in the scene being combined with the out exterior lighting. And so the things that... And for the people that are in the audience that are in, in the area of computer graphics, the, the, just the, the initial heroic part is almost all the light from the scene are not direct. They're That's all indirect right. it's lighting. It's all indirect exactly. lighting. And so um, what you're seeing is that any point in the scene, for example, here, can be illuminated by anything else in the scene. And so I'm simulating light coming in, hitting this, bouncing off of here, reflecting off of any number of surfaces, and finally making its way to this indirect area. So what you'll see, even after less than a minute, is that you have all these subtle shadows, you have very, very clear demarcation of, of the sub subtleties in the corners, you have the semi-reflective table. I uh, see the lamp reflected on the tabletop. You see the lamp now, reflected th on the What's table. amazing is that, that apparently that piece of glass is obviously captured as a geometry and has its own BRDF, Correct. because light is going into the glass uh -huh. and is bouncing around inside the glass and uh -huh. is escaping through the side, and that's one of the reasons and why it lights up on the edge. That's right, and yeah. so you see the little, that little, little there. bright light there. So these little yeah. subtle things are things that, you, that really make it appear to be a photograph mm -hmm. to you. If they're not there, you notice that they're not there. Mm -hmm. But these are, these are effects that are very difficult to achieve in the current CPU ray tracers because they require you to set up each, I would have to set up a lot of parameters for this table to make sure that it actually was able to calculate that point. Now, now Ken, what's amazing here is this. I mean, is this, this entire scene is BRDF driven. Correct. And, and it's got this new renderer in it. Um, you've incorporated it into 3ds Max. Now, what do I have to do as a user to launch this render? This is it? That's it exports everything to the render? It exports everything to iRay? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think what we should be clear that there's a Quadro in this box and a Tesla. So we're really talking about just two machines here doing something. Now, if you, if you had the CPU do the same task, we'd still be looking at a dark screen. We'd mm -hmm. still, even with, you know, anytime you have to try to physically calculate things precisely as they should be, you know, you don't, you don't have the power right now with the CPUs. Even if I had 100 CPUs, mm -hmm, it would mm -hmm. still be. Now, of course, just now when we first launched the, the render, within a second or two, uh, I saw the scene. Mm -hmm. right? And, and um, although it's going to take, we could still continue to improve the quality of that scene mm -hmm. over the course of, of several minutes, within about a few seconds, I now yeah. know whether I've lit it properly, yeah. I like the design, I have the feeling for the scene now. Um, whether I like the angle, so on and so forth. Right? Yeah, this that's is a fantastic mm -hmm. feedback because immediately, almost immediately, mm -hmm. I can make my creative decisions and decide to, you know, to go in a different direction, change the lighting, change the time of day, whatever it is, but I get immediate feedback, and that's what drives the creative process. Now, you're, you're, you're now done creating this amazing beauty, the mm -hmm. building, and you want to go show it to a client. Yes. Right? And you want to go take this out to a client, and you're saying, um, but you can't pack this... HP, right. this wonderful HP workstation with 
with uh, with two CPUs. Is it four CPUs or two? It must be it's four. It's two, two quad core. Right? Two two, quad it's cores, a dual yeah. quad core. Dual quad core. I see. There were 16 threads. It must be hyper threads. Right. Yes. I see. Okay. So there were dual quad core and two GPUs. You can't lug this thing around. I can't. I know that. Right. But and yes. so, but you you take this out to your client, and your client says, you know what? Um, I want to see it from a different angle. Right. Is there is there a way for us to do that? Yes. So let's move from what's shipping uh, next week to subscription customers is some research that we've been doing with uh, the mental images and NVIDIA team. So here we're going to take you to the cloud. And this is the first really showing of uh, 3ds Max having published the data to the cloud. Now mm -hmm. what can you do with it? Now Ken, let me see if I, if I understand here. Now, now uh, you're at the client, you're on this laptop. Yes. And, and um, uh, you open up a browser. And you have you've now published uh, your data out to the cloud. Correct. And this could be in this particular case. Where are we hosting this? This is hosted at Pier One Hosting mm -hmm. in uh, Toronto, about uh, 2,500 miles away. 2,500 miles away. So your your workstation is now 2,500 miles away. You've you've uh -huh. published yeah. from native 3ds Max up into the cloud, and you've taken this laptop out to the client. And the client says, you know what? That's that's really close, but but. Um, Right. Not quite right. They look at this, they say, well, that's a nice final image, but that's, uh, I'd rather look around the room. Well, because we're running in the cloud 32 Fermi processors all simultaneously working on the same image, I can just simply walk around the room in real wow. time. And uh, <laughs> what you're seeing is, I think, the first great. full interactive photorealistic <laughs> rendering. Now, what's, what's happening here, Michael? So, so uh, it's not this laptop that's doing this. No, so, the laptop so is let's just see. a web browser. I, so send, I send to the cloud. Just in my position. My I, position. Yeah. And, and then you rent. OK, go ahead. And the, the cloud, all 32 Fermi processors are working simultaneously on this image. Um, they're all running exactly the same IRA software that's run in inside Max. And we can guarantee that the image that you will get from this is exactly pixel for pixel accurate to what you would get in 3ds Max, just a lot faster. And you can see that when I, le when I lift up my, um, my mouse, then it just simply converges onto the final frame. Instead of taking maybe 30 minutes to converge on the local machine, it converges in 10 seconds. So well, essentially let's, let's what I have is full, full image, uh, full photorealistic image rendering in near real time. Mm -hmm. Now show me some of the art in this room. So um, I'm, I'm one of the clients and... and um, well, we could, for example, go to a, uh, an alcove here, get a little view of the room, notice that there's nothing, there's nothing there. I could add some objects for you. Okay. Uh, let's say we want to add a, a difficult object, a vase, which is uh, glass, and it's going to cause all sorts of interesting things, and uh, a reflective object. And um, again, I'm just telling the server to turn on these objects. Now you can see... Uh, you're, you're, being, you're being heroic. Mm -hmm. Just because you want to do a demonstration, I mean, the, these two objects are particularly difficult yeah, to render for computer graphics. Especially this one, this yeah. nasty glass thing, because not only is it difficult to render this, let's take a closer look at the vase, but um, it is casting light into the environment wow. through caustics, and so light is coming in through the glass, hitting this, and then being refracted back down to cause that green tinge on the, on the uh, counter. And again, this is something that really requires a physical simulation of light to get it well, right. Well, that could have been a texture map that's pre-baked, right? It could be, except I can change the time of day and prove to you that we really are doing this interactively. Wow. wow. If I get that's to. something else. I think this is really the first time customers will have real-time, uh -huh. interactive, photoreal tools for collaboration and decision making. It just hasn't existed before. And so, so uh, from now on, well, you guys, 3ds Max is used by the vast majority of the world's architecture yes. firms. Correct. And so now, now all of these, all of these uh, architecture firms and interior design firms that want to go out to clients and show them their, their, their wonderful work of art, they could do it on a laptop, exactly. they could do it in their office, they could do it anywhere on the web. Yeah, they, uh, many customers have told me that they're usually changing the proposal on their, uh, in the taxi on the way to the uh, customer. So this uh -huh. gives them the unlimited flexibility of just showing up with a browser and then taking their customer through it and, and responding to the customer's mm -hmm, interests. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Guys, this is really a great breakthrough.
Yeah, we think so. Congratulations, Ken. Thanks. Thank you. Congratulations, Thank Michael. You. Good job.